Hello, everyone, and welcome to this episode of Pod Save Chocolate. My name is Clay Gordon. I'm your host and your moderator, and I'm also the creator of thechocolatelife.com. Um, before we jump into today's episode, which is going to be about alternative chocolates, um, I want to um, point out and thank everybody who was a member of The Chocolate Life, because you guys are the sponsors. You guys, members of The Chocolate Life are the sponsors of this episode and every episode of Pod Save Chocolate. So if you're not currently a member of The Chocolate Life, you can go over there and become a member. Um, I'll show you what that looks like in just a little while, and we'll talk about it over the course of um, the episode. And um, I just want to jump into today's topic after reminding everybody, um, you can go into the comments, whether it's the live chat replay on YouTube or the comments on LinkedIn and Facebook. And what you can do is you can let me know where in the world you're connecting from today. I don't need to know if you're connecting from YouTube, LinkedIn, or Facebook. I'll see that. But you can let me know if you're connecting from the United States or you're connecting from somewhere in Europe or someplace else in the world. Just really love to know where people are connecting from um, so that um, I can give you a quick shout out on the screen. And of course, if you have questions about today's topic or you have comments that you'd like to make, you can throw them into the comments wherever you're watching and I can get them up on screen and I can get them asked and answered. And with that, I just want to do just a real quick uh, jump. This is the homepage of the chocolatelife.com right now. Um, there's a little bit of upgrade uh, updating I need to do because I've got a Thanksgiving, um, I've got a Thanksgiving message there. Um, but there's been a couple of changes over the last couple of weeks. One of which is that I've reorganized the top of the page so that these Pod Save Chocolate episodes um, appear at the top. So you don't have just the the current one, but you've got the past three. I started an episode with Brigitte Racine um, uh, about letters, and we're going to I'm going to uh, put those here as we go back and forth, and also the member newsletters. So just just a quick, uh, just we're playing with the way the website looks in order to make it a little more obvious um, about where things are and to give um, people uh, better access, and also to know that if you do come here um, next to the down arrow, these are now pull down uh, drop down menus. So you've got access to a lot of stuff, including the Chocolate Life Live archive over here. So lots of stuff going on in terms of changes. Um, I want to do a quick shout out um, to Duncan Armstrong. Duncan, who is um, watching from the UK. Um, Duncan, hey, thanks for thanks for letting me know um, that you're watching today. And again, if you have questions about anything that we're talking about here, um, please put them into the comments. So today's topic is um, alternative chocolates. And not just any alternative chocolate, but some alternative chocolates from a company called Win Win Food Labs, WNWN Win Win Food Labs. Now, people who have followed the Chocolate Life Live and people who are reading my articles in International Confectionery Magazine know that the topic of alternative chocolates is something that I've been following over the last, oh, you know, well over a year. And I've written articles on it for International Confectionery. I've talked about it on the Chocolate Life Live. Um, and also um, I've done tastings um, that include uh, a company that used to be called COA, QOA, and are now Planet A Foods and a product called No COA. We've talked about cell culturing as opposed to precision fermentation, a bunch of different approaches to the idea of creating an alternative chocolate. And what is an alternative chocolate? So just, you know, so we can, we can set the stage here. So an alternative chocolate is a chocolate adjacent product. And it's the attempt to make something that tastes like chocolate, smells like chocolate, breaks like chocolate, um, chews and melts like chocolate and works. So bakes like chocolate would. And if you put it into, um, uh, a tempering machine, you actually don't need to temper an alternative chocolate, um, but you, you use it like compound, which technically is what these alt dot chocolates are. They are compound. But instead of using cocoa powder um, as the flavoring, what they're doing is they're using other ingredients for the flavoring. Um, and um, it, they might include, for example, precision fermentation as a way to take some input um, and then um, create some, um, some create some flavor and some bulk and some powder from it, and then to bring another flavor ingredient into it. And if it sounds a little complicated, it's because different manufacturers use different um, approaches to get where it is that they're going. So it's it's just you know, the, but the important you know common thread 
um, across all of them is number one is that no cocoa is involved in actually making the actual product when it comes to using a technique called precision fermentation, right? If I'm using cell culturing, what it is I'm doing is I'm taking actual um, cells from cacao um, seeds. And then what I'm doing is I'm growing them in a lab and I'm using that uh, instead of actually using um, cocoa seeds um, to make the product. The other thing is, is that, that these things share is that um, we have a question as to what fat is going to be used in them. So am I going to be using a non-cocoa butter fats um, entirely, in which case I am making uh, a, a compound. So I'm using what are called cocoa butter equivalents and cocoa butter replacements instead of using cocoa butter. Um, and the cocoa butter equivalents and the cocoa butter replacements are designed to simulate the mouthfeel and melt of a cocoa butter um, at, at roughly the same uh, temperature point so that they melt in your mouth in something that is sort of like cocoa butter. Right. Um, but the question there are lots of questions of, about this um, and what it means. And the reason why I'm talking about this specific chocolate win-win is number one, I've interviewed um, one of the co-founders of the company, Johnny Drain, on at least two separate occasions over the last 15, 18 months. Um, I had an interview with uh, Johnny about this time last year where he shared with me one of the products that were in development. And um, his name came up in my LinkedIn feed um, last a uh, couple of weeks ago. And as a part of that, I reached out to um, somebody at the company and I said, hey, um, why don't you send me some samples? And the LinkedIn post that they shared was around the, um, the idea that um, of creating um, analogs, um, I call them makalits, uh, so uh, of other companies' products. So they created a version of a Tony's Chocolate Only bar. So this is um, a straight um, milk chocolate analog. Um, so what they call M.LK, M.LK, milk um, choc. So they can't call it chocolate because it doesn't contain any cocoa. Um, they produced an alternative to a Cadbury whole nut, dairy milk whole nut bar. And they created a mocklet of a Terry's um, orange bar. So this reminded me um, that several years ago, Tony's Chocolate Only um, had a campaign where what they did is they produced bars that were, from a mold perspective um, and from a wrapping perspective, were um, mocking um, or calling attention to or calling out um, other brands that they felt weren't um, living up to their obligations when it comes to illegal labor, deforestation, and other issues, things that are uh, important to um, Tony's, um, Tony's customer base. And so I thought there was a really, really sort of a meta inception-y um, aspect to this, that what they're doing, especially because of this Tony's mock, mocklet bar, that what they're doing is they're sort of you know, you know, this is a mocking of a Tony's bar where Tony mocked a bunch of other companies. Um, and what they're doing is just, you know, an inception kind of thing. And I thought it was interesting. And these represent, I think, some of the first commercial releases of this product. Right? So I wanted to be able to get my hands on them and taste them and give you all of my uh, opinions of them. And so as I do for every single one of the episodes, and this is one of my longest uh, posts in the last while, what I did is um, not only do, you know, are the links of where to watch all the episodes listed here, but um, there's a link to a long post that I wrote, um, which is uh, about this um, particular topic. So I go into great depth uh, about this, and I'm going to go talk about this over the course of the rest of the episodes. Um, and you know, let me get that up on screen because this is where I'm going to spend um, a lot of my time uh, talking. Um, and um, um, and I lost my train of thought. It happens sometimes when you're doing a live, um, a, a doing a live thing. So while I'm trying to grab my train of thoughts, I want to do a quick a shout out to um, um, Mark and Yuri at Boosters Chocolates in Kittredge, um, Colorado. Uh, Mark, thank you very much. Um, I'm glad you liked the, uh, the review of the topic. And uh, Louis Barnett. Um, Louis, um, you love the idea. Love the idea of what? 
please, I'd like to know what you love the idea of. Um, and so I can go and can I can go and can continue um, the discussion here. So let me grab the actual post where I'm talking about, which is which is this one here is win wins cocoa free chocolate alternative um, any good. Right. And uh, what I want to uh, uh, what I want to do is point out um, that um, <clears throat> there is a link to a post on confectionery production. Um, Confectionery Production Magazine. There's a link to my article about the Tonys, the Four Bars Too Far article. This is on the Chocolate Life. And then there's an extensive unboxing and review of the products. And we're going to follow along uh, to some extent on those things. So before we jump onto that, I want to jump onto um, the what it is that Lewis has to say, which is, is, I love the idea. I just don't think the taste is quite there yet. I was also a little disappointed that they contain gluten and undisclosed vegetable oil. I really hope they keep developing the taste. Um, those are all going to be things that I'm going to talk to you about, um, but I don't love the idea, right? And I think it will be obvious why I don't love the idea as we get um, in uh, into this over the course of the next 45 minutes or so, for 45 minutes or so. But I do agree with you. Um, they do contain gluten, right? Because one of the ingredients in all of these bars one is barley. Um, they also contain oats. And for some reason, it's listed as an allergen. Um, and um, they also contain undisclosed vegetable fats. And because it's 100% vegetable fats, that's one of the reasons why technically this will um, qualify, these bars qualify as compound. Now, I want to start off um, with, with the fact that they sent me some collateral material. So they sent me this little brochure with the bars. Um, and I want to point out that one of the things that they say um, when it comes to um, one of the representations that they make uh, in the collateral material that they sent is that mass-produced cocoa was responsibility for, responsible for 2 million child slaves in West Africa. And one of the things that you, know, you, know, you don't want to do is you don't want to give a um, reporter a member of the press, someone like me, um, low-hanging fruit. Just here's a claim that you're making, and there is you, you don't have any way of backing up that claim. No set of statistics that I have seen over the course of the last several years says that there are 2 million child slaves um, working in West Africa. And you know, one of the things I said in the article is, hey, if you guys have got better statistics than I do, please send them to me, and I'll, I will go and I will go and update this article and I will say, okay, all right, you know, 2 million child slaves. But it turns out I don't have to because um, in an investor document that they shipped out, um, and I don't know where this is. So this was sent to me by someone who saw the post that I did yesterday, um, who is here, we have child and slave labor. And what we do is they have 1.5 million child laborers. So in their own materials, right, they actually refute this claim. So they are aware that this 2 million child slaves is in fact an exaggeration. Or if they didn't, I mean, this is an example of incompetent fact-checking internally. There was no editorial controls on what they're writing and how they're, they're presenting themselves. So really, really bad idea, guys, because one of the things this makes me do um, is it makes me question every other statistic that you're going to present anywhere in any of your materials, right? I, because this is patently wrong, right? And you know it's wrong because here it is in your document, 1.5 million. There it is right there, 1.5 million child laborers, right? And it doesn't say how many of them are slaves. So, you know, this is, you know, I, I don't know how you, you justify this, right? Has, you know, nothing to do with what this product tastes like. It has nothing to do with any of the other claims. But that claim, right, is patently wrong. And you guys need to, so whoever wrote this, um, who wrote these materials, you need to go and redo this, right? Because this is a disservice um, to everyone who's involved in this, in this project. And it's a disservice for you. And there's no reason for you to undercut your argument with such a silly mistake. I mean, it is really, really, it's like, oh, I look at the rest of this and go, eh, 
not a problem. And, you know, there's some other things like we use 90% less water and 80% fewer greenhouse gas emissions. Well, they don't use 80% fewer greenhouse gas emissions. Maybe they produce 80% fewer greenhouse gas emissions, but they don't use them. And so there's a whole, I mean, you know, is it just sloppiness? Right, it, you know, I, you know, never attribute to um, being devious that which can be, you know, never attribute to malice that which can be attributed just to incompetence. And so, you know, do I give them the benefit of the doubt here for doing this? Um, maybe I'm not sure, but this is some pretty egregious, some pretty egregious overlooking things. But while we're here, what I want to do is I want to point out to this 1.5 million child laborers, right, is that between Cote d'Ivoire and Ghana, right. There are roughly 1.3 million family farms involved in cocoa production. So roughly 800,000 in Ghana, roughly 500,000 in the Ivory Coast, right? Based on the 800,000 number I got from the head of the Ghana Cocoa Marketing Board um, when I was in London, right? 800,000, which means that on average, there's on every family farm involved in cocoa in Cote d'Ivoire and Ghana, there is one child who's involved in some form of illegal labor. And that's a chilling statistic. When you think about it, that's how widespread it is. Now, my understanding from talking with Terry Collingsworth um, at International, right, Adv International Rights Advocates is there might be about 30,000 actual slaves, people, you know, children who are trafficked into this, I mean, which is you know, 30,000 too many, you know, in, in my opinion. But um, it just gives you an idea about um, the scale of the challenge that needs to be addressed if we're doing this. Um, all right, so what I want to do before I jump on to the next point, again from Lewis, who's clarifying, I only love the idea as I was a chocolatier for 11 years, and dark chocolate can give me migraines. Oh, the irony. Um, uh, yeah, and, you know, absolutely. You know, and from that perspective, and thank you for clarifying, Lewis, I, you know, I, I agree. Um, and it's something that I bring out in one of my conclusions. Um, to this. The other thing that I want to point out, right, is um, that there is a claim that the company makes, right? Um, again, this is from their investor deck, and it's they've developed a process for making a flavor identical cacao free alternative to chocolate, right? And based on these samples, um, I can say that maybe what it is that they've done is they've developed something that is flavor identical to a cheap compound, right? Um, this product is not aimed at the specialty cocoa and the specialty chocolate marker in, and the people who buy craft chocolate and the people who buy specialty chocolate who are looking for things related to um, varietal nuance and origins, right? The the um, the market for this is companies and consumers who um, are looking for attributes in their cocoa and chocolate which are different from the attributes that craft chocolate lovers like. Right. So, I mean, one of the things that they claim, right, I, you know, I, I, I can't independently verify this, but one of the things they claim is that their product, right, is one third less expensive than conventionally produced mass market chocolates. Right. Um, and there are a couple of reasons why that might be so. Um, number one is in the UK, right, the one of the primary sources of this is barley. Yay. So they did. Right. So they're growing barley in the UK, then, you know, they don't have to go anywhere. And so they're not shipping it, you know, thousands of miles on container ships. Um, the other one is that um, another ingredient, this is carob. And the carob is the largest producer of carob in the world is Portugal. So it's a hop, skip and a jump across, you know, the channel, uh, across the channel uh, from Portugal to the UK. So again, there are fewer greenhouse emissions associated with transportation. I don't know anything about you know, what it takes to grow carob um, and compared with cocoa. Um, but I can I can imagine that there are greenhouse gas um, CO2 savings um, there. Um, and, um, but I do wonder uh, how much carob there is in the world, 
right? So, you know, can I create a product, right, which is going to scale up to meet the demand of all of those applications where, for example, I've got a candy bar. So it's basically about nougat or caramel or penis or some other kind of nut. And there's a very, very thin layer of chocolate around the outside. Right. And oftentimes this very thin layer of chocolate is, in fact, a thin layer of compound. Right. Or I'm doing something which is shelled very, very inexpensively and I'm using a compound or I'm, I'm using some chocolate which already contains some mix of um, non cocoa butter fats, cocoa butter equivalents and cocoa butter replacements. So um, if uh, this is where this product, as it is currently constituted, you know, based on these samples, fits in. It's where, you know, chocolate is not necessarily the primary component, but it's also for people who are saying, you know what, I want to, I want a product that is vegan, right? I want a product where I can be assured that there's no illegal child labor associated with it. I want a product which has got a lower environmental footprint and, you know, it's not disgusting to taste. Right. And, and that's a really, really interesting point. Um, so one of the things they did, and it's one of the things that I point out um, in the article, um, is that they sent, um, you notice when they sent um, this bar, they included a Cadbury Dairy Milk whole nut bar. So I could taste the difference. But, you know, here's the model. Here's what it is that they're creating a mocklet for. Um, and here's their equivalent. And then I can go and say, all right, so here is the, the Terry's orange bar, which is this one here. All right. So this is the Terry's orange bar. But what I wanted to do in the course of the tasting review is that they said these things are flavor identical. You know, this is a one, this is a, you know, it works like chocolate right? It melts like chocolate, it breaks like chocolate, and it tastes like chocolate. And so taking them at their word, it tastes like chocolate. I, I said, okay, I'm going not to give them the benefit of the doubt. I'm going to, as a professional uh, writer, reviewer, cal critic, evaluator, whatever it is, I'm going to give my impressions of what these chocolates um, what the win-win chocolate is. And from looking at the ingredients, and oh, by the way, um, I do provide the ingredients list for each of the bars, right? So you've got the back in terms of photos. You can read the ingredients uh, for each of them. So there they are. Um, and then I list them out. Um, and so you've, you've got them in both in a picture form as well as written them out. And they do say, oh, it's dairy-free, palm oil-free, caffeine-free. So there is a group of people for whom... You know, I want a guaranteed caffeine chocolate adjacent product, right? I want something which is vegan, right? In a chocolate adjacent product. I, it, I'm not a celiac, so I don't worry about gluten-free. I'm not, I don't care about a gluten-free diet. Um, there are other things that I'm looking for uh, in what it is that I'm doing. And again, this may be a part of a larger, a part of a larger, um, a part of a larger uh, candy bar or something like that. It's, it's one ingredient in a, in a larger bar. But what I can say about this, and I do, um, um, I do go, you know, there are extensive flavor and tasting notes here. So I do an unboxing and tasting for each one of the bars. And then there's a, a TLDR uh, review of it. Um, so the first one of which is that the overall aroma of all three of these bars um, is what I would think of as a slightly toasted Portuguese roll. So it's a sweet, almost brioche. If you're from the United States, more like a Hawaiian bun. So it's a sweet, doughy, right thing. And it's sort of like the, um, the crust. That is the predominant aroma here. Now, I have tasted milk chocolates that have less aroma than this. So that necessarily on its own is not a bad thing. Um, but the aroma here is not strong chocolate. And it's not strong chocolate on any of the three of the bars that I, I've tasted here, right? And it's not dairy either, right? So there's no dairy. So it's oat milk, right? Which is oat, so it's oat milk. Um, and so there is this sort of 
roasted grain um, aspect of it, which is which I characterize as a, as a Portuguese bun, but I'm sure that it comes from the oat milk as much as it does from the fermented barley. Now, whatever it is they're choosing as fats, and Lewis, you're absolutely right. They just say vegetable fats, plural. Right. And actually, in one of the bars, they actually say vegetable fat. So it's a typo, probably. I'm going to assume that the base chocolate for all of these three is the same. This the base chocolate analog the, that is being used for here. The most milk chalk that's used is the same base recipe for all three of these things. Um, is that, um, you know, you just can't overcome that toasted grain sweet. Right. Um, um, aspect of this. Um, it's, a, you know, whatever fat they're using here to get back is that it is a really good from a break perspective um, um, uh, substitute for a well-tempered um, cocoa butter. I mean, in that respect, they've, they've nailed it, um, but they're not open about it. You know, you know, what I really want them to do is, you know, I want them to go in here and if we, we zoom up on this um, it says um, vegetable fats. Right? What vegetable fats? I mean, even in the Cadbury, even in the Cadbury um, equivalent of this chocolate bar, all right, it lists the fact that they use palm and shea oil. Now, on the back of this, it will say that there is no palm oil. You know, kudos to them, right, for for saying that. But they don't let us know what the fats are, and uh, it would be really, really nice to know. Cocoa butter has some heart health benefits associated with it. It's just as olive oil is, the, the triglyceride structure uh, turns it into a, um, into in the body, it, it works like an unsaturated fat as opposed to a saturated fat. Saturated fats are solid at room temperature. That's one way you can tell the difference between a saturated fat and an unsaturated fat is how, you know, what their state is when they're at room temperature. Um, but um, it's, um, you know, when they're talking about all this disclosure about other things in the process, um, not being open about what fats they're using here is, I think, an issue. Um, because a lot of people, I mean, I'm one, Lewis said that he would like to see them. I think that they need to be more open and more transparent about what the fats are um, so that we can determine, you know, number one, are they healthy fats? Because that for many, many people, having a healthier product is a part of what it is they're looking for. It's not just that it's vegan. It's not just that is, it uh, has other attributes. It's dairy free. Oh, you know, we'd like to know that, you know, it is maybe better for us than other things. Um, and, you know, so it's really, really important. And I'm really, um, really disappointed. Even when I, you know, smell the break, right? It is nothing but um, this toasted bread um, component. It's not yeasty. Right, it's not yeasty. It's just the grain, which is the outside of this toasted sweet bread, um, which is the aroma component. Um, the bite is good. When you bite down on it, right, it's good. The chew is nice and easy. It's really, really cold here. I'm dressed warmly because it's only about sixty degrees in the house, and I don't want to run the don't want to run the heat too much. Right. But the melt um, is not as clean as a good cocoa butter is going to be. There's a slight dustiness in the texture. So there's a slight texture there. Um, and, you know, if you're, if you like, you know, a Tony's milk chocolate bar, right, which is, this is for, there's no, there's no dairy in this. There's no milk in this. This is not a replacement, right? It is not flavor identical. Right, to a milk chocolate. Now, maybe the underlying cacao replacement is flavor identical, but because of the rest of the ingredients that are used, the finished product is not flavor identical. Um, so that's leading into the next comment from Duncan. Uh, and just full disclosure here, Duncan um, is uh, um, works at International Confectionery Magazine. Um, we have um, regular correspondence and some things. Um, so how does the taste of alternative chocolate compare to traditional chocolate and what factors contribute to its flavor? Um, well, as I said, right now, what I'm tasting in this one is I am tasting um, the grain, 
I'm tasting the oat milk, I'm tasting the carob, and um, I'm tasting the fermented barley, right? And as I say, it comes across not as a yeasted bread, so maybe it could be um, a chemically leavened bread, but it is, you know, Duncan, if you know what a Portuguese roll is, or you know what a Hawaiian, Hawaiian roll is, um, you'll, and you think about what that is. Now, that is only this product, right? I have to point out, that is only this one. So the actual flavor of other alternative chocolates is going to depend on what the um, balance of um, ingredients that they're, use, they're using for their product and how those ingredients are processed into making this. So when Win is using precision fermentation, um, they claim flavor identical. Mm, I'm not entirely, well, again, right? I don't know, you know, where is the primary flavor component from this? It's like a, it's like the chocolatey component is like a dull carob. It's like a not fully forward. Um, I don't know how much milk is in this. And so I, or how much, oat milk is in here. And so I don't have any way of comparing this. This is like, this is like a traditional European chocolate, which would have 30, roughly one third cocoa butter, one, one third cocoa butter, one third milk powder, one third, one third cacao mass, not just cocoa butter, but one third cocoa, one third milk, one third sugar. I don't know what the, the proportion of ingredients is in here. I don't know how much fat is in this. Um, I would have to go calculate per 100 gram bars, this is in um, kilojoules and calories. So kilocalories, um, you know, I'm looking, this is not a low fat product. Um, so there are, so in a 100 gram bar, and this is a 48 gram bar, 50 gram bar. So this bar contains, um, 20 grams of fat, uh, half of that is saturated fat. So, right, and it contains, um, this one bar contains 27 grams of carbs, of which 17 grams would be um, from added sugars. So um, you get an idea of what some of the makeup is in terms of, in terms of that. Um, but again, um, when I had a chance to, taste the koa product, now no koa from planet A, um, they used it to shell bonbons, right? And so, uh, so the shell molded bonbons. And so there was a very, very thin layer of chocolate, so, or this ch cocoa re chocolate replacement, which was surrounding a, um, a center. And, you know, it's very, very, it was very, very difficult to say this is the taste of the chocolate versus this is the taste of the center. And I think this is, you know, if it is less expensive to produce than traditional chocolate is, real chocolate, and I can put it into applications where there are other ingredients which are very highly flavorful, where the amount of chocolate and the flavor of the chocolate, as long as it's reminiscent of chocolate, it's okay. I mean, that's fine for what it is I'm doing. Uh, however, if you are looking, if, if you are looking for the attributes of we, what we might think of as a craft chocolate or a specialty chocolate, these things are going to um, be disappointing. Now, what I will say um, about them. So, Duncan, if I didn't answer your question, please let me know what you think about that. And then, are there any specific health benefits associated with the alternative chocolate, such as potential antioxidant properties or reduced allergenicity? So, number one. There is no discussion whatsoever about how many polyphenols um, and related um, molecules are in this product. That's not a part of the discussion. The part of this discussion, what people are going to respond to, right? Let me go over here. What people are going to be responding to is, right, right. We don't contribute to climate change as much. We don't use less water. We don't use as much water, sorry. Um, we don't contribute to deforestation and we don't contribute as much to illegal labor. So these are the brand attributes that are being highlighted, right? In a, in a fear-mongering presentation, chocolate production is a disaster, right? Right, may not be wrong there, right? But this is presented in a fear-mongering presentation, which I think is bad for everybody. Right. So they're not talking about 
potential health benefits associated with the fat component. Does it contribute to the elasticity of skin? I'm guessing not, right? Does it have antioxidants? I mean, they're not mentioned here. So I don't know the answer to the question. I'd have to go look up carob to find out what that is. I would really also be interested to know, you know, the source of the barley um, and whether or not um, we have to worry about uh, heavy metals contamination, right, because of the source of the barley, because grains are often very contaminated with uh, heavy metals, especially in, the, in industrialized countries. So there's there's no discussion of any of those things here. So reduced allergenicity. So we do have two ingredients here, which are listed as allergens, one of which is oats, and the other one is barley, right? And so Right, it, there's no dairy, so I don't have to worry about it from that perspective. Um, are there other allergens? It says it may contain traces of nuts. And one of the reasons why is even though there are no nuts in this bar, they do produce a bar, right? That's got uh, hazelnut paste in it. And so we do need to, we do need to recognize that. So am I going to be, um, is it going to be at a level which I may be affected by? Depends on how allergic to any of these substances you are. So that. So if I were to try the, the next bar. Um, so I'm going to go back um, and try another bar. Um, that other bar is going to be the, um, the chocolate bar. So number one, if you're doing a bar that has whole nuts in it, um, there is a texture associated with the nuts. And because this is using um, a hazelnut paste, um, and it would be more like a, a chocolate bar in which the hazelnut paste was um, mixed in. So more like a jandouille, right? So again, we have a, an aroma, you know, these two bars, almost impossible to tell apart on the aroma. There's only a very, very, very faint nuttiness, which you really have to be paying attention to to get to the nuttiness. Huh? The bite is a little softer and the chew is a little softer. We would expect that. The fats from the nuts are going to um, have an impact on the other fats that are used for this. Hmm? But the nuts on this don't come in for me this morning. Right until the very end, it's after everything is out of your mouth. That dominant, you know, toasty Portuguese bun roll flavor is dominant here, and the nuts come in at the very end. There is the same sort of slight dustiness. Not quite sure whether that's coming from. It's actually less pronounced in this bar, and it may be because of the additional refining or mixing necessary, or the fats that are associated with this. But you know, if I'm going to buy something that's got whole nuts in it. I want something that has whole nuts in it, right? If I want something that um, has got a whole lot of hazelnut flavor in it, um, I'm going to want to get um, a really good Jean Um So uh, again, this is going to be for uh, someone who is attracted to the other aspects of this, not necessarily the the fact that this is, you know, a, a, a going to compete with a specialty chocolate or a craft chocolate. And that Portuguese bun flavor, that Hawaiian roll flavor, just dominates on the finish. I mean, it's the only thing in my mouth. Um, and again, while the fat doesn't clear as cleanly as cocoa butter does most of the time, um, um, there is... Um, um, it there is some residue of fat in the mouth that doesn't clear uh, quite as cleanly um, as I would like it to. Um, it's not cloying. I mean, it's not it's it, it's not really really obvious, but it's there. And so one of the things that that fat does is it um, gives each one of these bars a very long finish because it's not clearing. There is this residue of fat in the mouth that's a little little harder to clear out. Um, the third bar is, um, again, it's really, really hard to compare the, um, the chocolate bar, which Win Win makes compared with the, the Cadbury Dairy Milk version. However, I will tell you that from my perspective, um, there is something weird about the Dairy Milk chocolate 
that was in the bar that they sent me. It was really, really unattractive as a, as a flavor profile. Um, they did mention using other fats in it, so great for them. But there was some flavoring in it that was just really weird. There was a brightness to it that was not a whole lot of fun to be able to taste. And so in many respects, I actually prefer the overall flavor of this bar compared with the bar that um, um, it's mocking. Um, but that doesn't mean I like it. I mean, it's preferable, better, right? But this is not something, I'm, I'm not going to go out and buy either of them for any reason, you know, whatsoever. Um, you know, um, so, right, and this is the third one. This is from Terry's, right? Or this is the mocklet for the Terry's bar. Um, the Terry's bar has an, you know, an obvious aroma of orange on the nose. This one, again, there's a very, very faint fragrance of the hint of the citrus in this. It's very, very faint. You have to stick your nose into it and you really need to hunt for it. It is there. It's just this bright note, which sits on top of the Portuguese roll um, and um, aroma. It's really, 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 really subtle. And it's slightly bitter um, because it's, it's using an extract, um, an oil, um, and um, there's a concentration to it, which you wouldn't get if you were just eating the fruit, right? So it's more like the oil from the skin rather than eating an orange straight. Um, again, the bite is good, the texture is good. The chew is good. The melt is good. Sorry for the noise of me chewing. Um, the orange starts to come through a little bit. And then the bread comes in and the orange comes in. So it's beating. Beats back and forth between the two flavors um, as the fat melts in your mouth and goes around. Um, this is the more complex of the three from a flavor perspective. Um, you know, you know, if you come from the UK, I, I spent three years of my, um, three of my teenage years in New Zealand. And so I think of Jaffa and things associated with Jaffa cake and, you know, orange flavored chocolates and the break apart oranges and things like that. Um, my sense is if you can do an orange bar, make it taste like orange. Um, this is really, really subtle. Um, now, the so Terry's bar is much less subtle. And I want to point out something which I think is really, really important here. Um, is that when Tony's did their four bars, what they did is they played a lot with the molds. And they made they made parodies of. They definitely um, went and took a look at what the molds of were from the the makers um, that they were making fun of. Um, and you know, all three of these bars are the same are the same mold. And you know the. The Terry's bar actually has little orange sections in it, sort of like Mandarin orange sections. And it's a little, you know, there's no sense of humor in this, right? Which is one of the things that Tony's did, and I think did well, right? Is that they they had this this humorous mocking component. And these are just way too serious, um, you know? And, you know, that may be because of this sort of fear-mongering nature of what they're doing. But this bar, um, if you're looking for something which has got a whole lot of orange flavor in it, um, it's very, very mild in what's going on. It's very, very mild, right? Um, and, you know, if you grow up on things like the Terry's Bar or Jaffa Cake or something like that, um, you, the, the flavor component here is not going to be what I think you want it to be, right? Um, maybe that's because what they're doing is they're trying to push their chocolate alternative to the front. Um, but if that's the case, I don't know why they chose um, to do it the way that they did, right? Um, so, you know, this is, you know, you know, is it flavor identical? No, right? Is it flavor identical with specialty chocolate? Let me, let me clarify that. No, it's not a flavor, it's not flavor identical with a specialty chocolate or a craft chocolate. If that's where you're coming from, you're not going to be happy with any of this. Um, if what you're doing, however, is you're eating candy bars with a little bit of, you know, again, with a little bit of chocolate and robe down the outside or something which is shelled. So it's a very, very thin layer of chocolate and there's a filling inside of it. 
then the chocolate itself is not all that important compared to the overall. No, it's not, not that it's not all important. It's not that present. It's not as large a component um, as the overall flavor profile of this. And so it's less important. And in that respect, yay, you know, this, you know, if that's where your expectations lie, um, it's, it's going to be an alternative. Um, however, if your expectation is this is going to replace, you know, a, a Cadbury, Del, uh, Cadbury Dairy Milk Bar with whole hazelnuts, it's not going to replace it from a texture perspective. And, you know, for some reason, you know, it was like there was just something weird about the dairy milk. And again, right, there's not much orange here. So it's not very flavor forward. And so you have to adjust your, um, your expectations or what it's going to be. And again, for many people, the idea that there may be no illegal labor associated with it, um, there may be a lesser impact on the climate, and they're willing to say, okay, all of those things I'm willing to um, overlook or I'm willing to accommodate myself to the fact that the, the chocolate flavor um, is not as intense as I'm looking for. And there are a lot of other things. It's like if I were to put this if I were to use this in some forms of ice cream, especially ones that had caramel or nuts in the ice cream, it could work there. Um, but by changing the chemical composition, the <clears throat> structure of the triglyceride and the fats, I could get something which held its shape um, in ice cream and melted pretty well. I could have something which worked in, in a baked item. And I can imagine this working really well in a wide range of bakery items. Uh, it's not going to be a baton in a pain au chocolat. I mean, it's not going to work for that um, and lots of other aspects. But if I've got a really, really sweet muffin that's got other stuff going on in it, then I'm sure that, you know, this has got, these chocolates have got a place there or these chocolate replacements, these chocolate alternatives, uh, macolits as I'm, as I'm calling them um, in a bunch, uh, in a bunch of ways. But that is my sense for how this from a flavor perspective is going, right? Um, and um, I do talk about a bunch of these things in the conclusions, um, which is in this post, um, where this is the long form, which supports the, um, the post about this episode of Pots of Chocolate. Um, so you can go through here um, and you can go and get a deep dive in which I'm talking about um, all of these things um, in great detail. But so, again, you know, the overall conclusions are going to be, um, right, could, so, and I do say something, so, here, right, which is um, the TLDR on this, whoops, oh, okay, right, is that printed on one long edge of the bar, actually, it's on all of them, but I just chose this one, it says, the future of chocolate. So this is right to left. So this is, it says the future of chocolate here. Um, and what I say is, um, if this is the future of chocolate, it's not a future I want to live in. So it could be a part of a future, but it is not the future of chocolate. Number one, it's not chocolate, right? So it can't be the future of chocolate. It's not going to be what chocolate turns into, right? Um, with perhaps one really important consideration, which is, if as a result of climate change, if as a result of climate change, um, that there is going to be a significant reduction in harvest of cocoa, right? What will happen is that the world will fraction into two tiers, right? There will be people who can afford real chocolate and there are people who can't afford real chocolate. And the people who can't afford real chocolate will have this because they can't afford anything else. And the people who can't afford real chocolate may not buy this because they can afford real chocolate. Um, and so that's one of the reasons why I say if this is the future of chocolate, I, you know, I don't want to be a part of it because I don't want to live in, I just don't want to live um, in that future. But, you know, is it a part of a future? And the answer is it certainly could be, but it will time to tell. And one of the reasons why I say is it took a lot of years for like plant-based meats to go anywhere. Um, in the marketplace. And there recently is some indication that the market growth is slowing um, when it comes to plant-based, which is a, a plant-based meat, which I just abhor as a label. Um, so I think cultivated meat 
um, is what's going on for cell culture, but plant-based meat, eh, ick, right? I have expectations for, a, you know, a cultured or pea protein alt steak as opposed to a beef steak. And, you know, it's, it's not there yet, right, in terms of providing that sense of satisfaction. So when you're drinking, for example, a low alcohol beer, you know that it's a low alcohol beer. There's some genetical, there's some essence which is missing, right? That says, this is not the real thing. And that's what I walk away from this. There's something missing, right? And this is not, that's missing. And it's, it doesn't provide the full sense, the range of sensory fulfillment that I've come to expect from chocolate, right? And so the real question will be, right, is, what is going to, how widespread is going to be the adoption of it? So roughly in the United States, 20% of the market is what we think of as gourmet chocolate or specialty chocolate, not mass market chocolate. This could become huge in mass market chocolate for people who are concerned as much with the cost of something. If this is cheaper um, than a conventional chocolate is, there are people who are going to say, oh, you know, instead of being $3, this is a you know, $2 and 20 cents, I'm going to buy it. And I don't really care. Right. It, 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 it gives me the sugar and mouthfeel that I associate with chocolate. So I'm going to go there. Right. But as I say, there are, and that's just as these products are currently formulated, they may get better. I don't know. I encourage WinWin to send me new products as they're moving forward with this to find out, Oh, how do the new products compare? with um, the previous generations, you know, what are the improvements over time? I mean, you know, is there a dark chocolate equivalent to these things? I don't know if there is or not. What does it taste like? Um, everything they've got here is this, um, you know, milk, milk alternative, right? There's no dark alternative that's going on here. But again, you know, you know, there are a lot of CBD products, CBD infused quote unquote chocolates. They're actually compound um, infused with CBD. And this would make you know, this would be a really, really straightforward replacement for more conventional compounds. Um, again, it's place where, you know, chocolate is, an, you know, real chocolate is an expensive ingredient and there's nothing about the product that says I need to be real chocolate to do it, All right? And so the final word being, while well, Win-Win's chocolate may melt, snap, and behave like regular chocolate, it does not yet, it does yet not, no, nah, I need to fix that. It does not yet taste like real milk chocolate. Uh, made with cocoa beans. It is not flavor identical at the moment. I want to, before I go, um, let me get two more. Um, so two more comments here. So Elmer, who is um, with Yokoa in Honduras, um, and we'll be doing um, a live stream with Elmer coming up in a little while. Um, I've got a bunch of his bars that he sent to me. Um, we'll be doing a live tasting and evaluation. Um, he's going to be in Honduras, and I'm going to be here in Arizona. We'll be doing that soon. Um, and so it is pretty bad. Again, I think what you need to do is you need to set your expectations. If you're looking at this, like, is this going to be like a craft chocolate? Is this going to be a specialty chocolate? That's not what this is. But if what you're looking at is, oh, would I really be able to tell the difference between this and what's around a Snickers bar or something like that? The answer is, eh, you know, if I wasn't twigged to it and I wasn't paying attention to it, would I be able to tell? Maybe not. Right. And so that quality judgment, bad, right, as opposed to good, right, really does go to what the expectations of the consumer are and what the expectations of the maker are. You know, again, what I would say, you know, is on my scale of, you know, zero to four in the chocolate emotional rating scale. Um, and let me know if that's something you guys would like me to talk about again is like rating reviewing and how I got to my rating scale. Um, this is not something I'm going to preferentially go out and purchase for enjoyment, right? I'm not going to go out and seek it. If somebody gave it to me, I probably wouldn't eat it, right? Knowing what it is, uh, unless it was something different from what I've already tasted. You know, I might be, you know, just curious as to what it is. Um, and then I probably wouldn't give it to anybody whose opinion mattered to me right? Unless it was, oh, here's an experiment. Let's get together and let's talk about it. So it fits at that end of the scale for me, uh, as opposed to, you know, you know, you, you know, this is a chocolate, you know, it, like, you know, if, if I had to have, if, if, if I could have chocolate for my last meal on earth, this is not the chocolate. <laughs> this is going to be, uh, you know, the chocolate I would choose for my last um, meal on earth. So Elmer, I, I just want to make sure that um, we, 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 um, 
are very, very careful about how we're defining it um, and where we're setting our expectations because I think it's really, really important. Uh, there are people who are going to love this. They just are. There are going to people who really, really, really love this, right? Are they wrong? No. You know, I don't have to eat it. They like it. Yay. Right. But there are some other things that I really want to talk about um, after I get to this next comment from Duncan, um, which I think is more serious and more sinister in some ways. Do you know if any ongoing research or innovations in all chocolate that could further enhance its nutritional value or taste in the future? And so, you know, Duncan, what I would say is this is the nature of food science and this is the world of flavorists. So I could imagine, I mean, there's no vanilla in any of these things. I could imagine where, especially in the nut bar, adding a little more salt would be really good. There's, there's sea salt in all of these recipes. Um, the, you know, if I had the, the, the hazelnut paste, if there was more salt in there, um, I could enhance it. I mean, it would be easy to infuse these with um, polyphenol powders and all sorts of things. It would just, if that was what I wanted to do, they could easily be added to the recipe. Um, I don't, you know, if you're using barley, right, as one of the base ingredients, I don't know what you can do in the process of fermentation in order to be able to enhance the, some of the nutritional component that's not there in the original. Can you do it? It may be. I mean, you can do a lot with precision fermentation, depending upon um, the organisms you're using and how you're, how you're moving forward. There could be a lot, especially if you're using um, um, modified organisms. So organisms which were bred specifically to do some specific things, you probably could. Um, it may make more sense to do these as additives, right? You know, if I added, you know, could I get a good, a, a better orange flavoring? And this uses grapefruit oil and orange oil. Um, right in it, interesting combination for an orange bar, putting grapefruit oil in it. Um, but, you know, could I use other things? Could there be um, some sort of nutritional? The answer is absolutely yes. Um, it would be relatively easy to enhance the nutritional profile of these things without, I don't think, altering the flavor very much. Would I do it as part of the culturing in terms of a self-cultured product? Would I do it part of the per precision fermentation? It would simply be a matter of looking at the relative cost. If it was cheaper to do it, putting an additive in as opposed to cheaper to doing it as a part of the process of fermentation, whichever was the least expensive would be the way I think most people would go or most manufacturers would choose to do it. Because one of the primary selling points of this is that it's less expensive than a conventional chocolate. And I don't think I'm going to do a whole lot to this to make it more expensive than it already is, uh, if I can avoid it. But I do want to close out. And I just want to say, like, this hour has just like, just like, just completely, completely blown by. It's been really quite remarkable. You know, here we are, like a minute and 30 seconds. And I didn't know that it, it would take that long to get through this. But what I really want to do is point out the fact that if this, if all chocolates, right, um, become popular, in the marketplace. The who is going to suffer the most with this is cocoa farmers. Right? So if if I can reduce the amount of cocoa which is necessary from 5 million metric tons a year to 4 million metric tons a year, so 20% reduction in cocoa. What that's going to do, it's going to reduce pressure. I've got oversupply, the cost of cocoa is going to drop right? And then it's the individual smallholder farmer. Remember, 1.3 million smallholder family farms in Cote d'Ivoire and Ghana. So there is no discussion whatsoever about these products, about what is the potential impact to the farmers. Now, if these guys spent 20% of their, their gross profits and use them to combat deforestation, if they use them to combat illegal child labor and slavery and things like that, right? That might be that would be definitely something that would, um, um, I think would be a good thing for the entire industry. But, you know, if what in fact they're doing is they're also moving what they're, you know, one way of interpreting this, not necessarily a charitable way of interpreting this, is that, hey, farmers, you know, we here in the global north have been taking advantage of you for at least 50 years or more, maybe longer, maybe hundreds of years, right? You've been involved in a colonial agricultural 
exercise. Um, and, you know, we've been keeping you know, a foot on things and, you know, you guys have never been able to, or most of you have never been able to, as an individual smallholder farmer, actually been able to live an aspirational life where your children and your children's will have a better life than the one you have on the farm, right? There's nothing here that addresses that. It's basically saying, hey, thanks. You know, we've taken advantage of you for the last 50 years, 100 years, 300 years, whatever it is, and now we're just going to abandon you, right? Because, right, our policies, right, have increased or deforestation, and, you know, our policies, you know, big chocolate, big cocoa, their policies have resulted in deforestation. And so this is where I have a real problem with this, right? Is that they say, listen, deforestation is a problem in chocolate, right? Water use is a problem in the cocoa to chocolate supply chain, um, right? Greenhouse gas emissions are a problem in the cocoa to chocolate supply chain. Illegal labor and slavery is a problem in the cocoa supply chain, right? And what we're going to do is we're going to move all the production to, oh, the UK, where they grow barley, and to Portugal, you know, where they grow carob, and to other places. Again, I would really like to know where the fats come from, right? What kind of fats they are and where they are sourced to understand what's going on. I mean, the only, you know, really questionable ingredients here is the sugar. Can they guarantee there's no illegal labor in the sugar production? What is the... There, there are lots of questions that we need to ask about this, right? Um, number one, I believe just that this kind of research has got value, right? You never know when, you know, some bit of research is going to come across some answer that's going to solve a problem that you didn't set out in the first place to solve. I mean, I think that's really, really good. I think that, again, there are applications for this that are going to be really, really interesting. But what I don't read in the materials that I've seen here is any concern for the potential, so 1.3 million family farms is somewhere around, let's just use seven. So it's around, you know, 10, 12 million people, right, whose lives and livelihoods depend upon cocoa production or in, in whole or in part, just in the Ivory Coast and Ghana. Right. There's no concern what, what, whatsoever for what happens to those people. And um, in the end, for me, um, that's why I am going to seek right, ways to uh, bring restorative agriculture um, into deforested lands. So can we go to degraded pasture lands? and turn them using agroforestry and other techniques? Can we restore them, right, to productive, um, productive agricultural lands, um, which also support biodiversity, right? So I'm, I'm definitely for that in doing that. Um, can we use those techniques on lands which might have been degraded through oil production and mining? Definitely for that, right? And, and getting the dollars associated um, with that into the hands of the people on the ground into the pockets of the people on the ground um, to improve their lives and livelihoods in that way. Can we use um, our understanding of um, good agricultural products to increase productivity so we can produce the same amount of cocoa on less land using less water and fewer agricultural chemicals? I'm all for that kind of stuff, right? And I don't hear any of that in what it is that the proponents of alt chocolates are saying. Um, and um, I think that in the long run, right, if what we as consumers of higher quality, well, specialty chocolate, if we as consumers of products made with specialty cocoa, right, um, want to ensure that we are going to continue to have specialty cocoa um, and chocolate products available um, at reasonably affordable prices, what we need to do is to focus on solutions to the problems that exist in producing countries and not just ignore them and try to say, you know, thank you, but no thank you, right? You know, technology, investment, all this kind of stuff, right, is happening um, here outside in consuming countries rather than cocoa producing countries, chocolate consuming countries, not cocoa producing countries. And we're just going to abandon them.
right? And I think that from, so that's one of my commitments. So one of the things about pod safe chocolate is what am I going to commit to, right? Uh, and I'm asking everybody who listens to these and watches these things is when we think about pod safe chocolate, what are you going to do? What are you going to commit to this week, this month, you know, next quarter, next year to save chocolate? Right? That's, the, that's the, the whole recasting of this for me. And so one of the things I'm going to do from a pod save chocolate perspective, and one of the commitments I'm going to do is to promote this notion that we can't just avoid the problems. We can't ignore the problems. We can't say thank you, but no thank you. And then turn our attention to other things and just leave the mess for someone else to clean up all the millions of lives, right, which have the potential to be devastated because we're no longer purchasing cocoa from them. We're not pretty giving them an alternative. Where is the empathy? Where is the compassion? Where is the understanding? Where is the accepting responsibility, right, in those things, right? And that's what I want everybody to consider. Um, and that's what I want um, to leave everyone with um, today. Um, after uh, reminding everybody that um, the, um, this episode of The Chocolate Life has been um, sponsored by um, members of the chocolatelife.com. So you can go to the chocolate life. Um, here is the homepage right now. Um, you can, I'm signed in. So it says account here, but if you were to go in, it's got my little avatar in the lower right hand corner. But if you were to go and um, set up, if you weren't signed in, that would say join. So you can go in. There's always a free membership level. So you can go and join the chocolate life. And one thing that's really important to know about the important, the chocolate life, um, when you are a member, is that there is the option to um, enter into a discussion on every post on The Chocolate Life. Um, you got to be a member to comment, right? So if you want to be able to comment on the posts on The Chocolate Life, you have to become a member. Again, there's always a free member. I appreciate everybody's support for there. As well as if you're watching on YouTube, um, go subscribe to the channel, like the video, add a comment, do a thumbs up. All those sorts of things um, help what it is um, that I do here on the chocolate life. And with that, I'm going to say thanks everybody who's been watching from the beginning to the end. I'll be back here on Friday, the which is the 1st of December. We will be doing um, my December um, AMA, Ask Me Anything, um, as well as News Roundup. We'll be talking about things. Um, I want to do a final quick shout out to Elmer. So thank you very much. Thank you, um, um, Elmer, for that shout out. I really do appreciate the support. And I want to remind everybody again is if you're working with chocolate and you're not having fun, you're doing it wrong. So in this commitment to pod safe chocolate, remember, this is a product we love. It makes it makes me happy, right, to know that I'm doing this and it gives me happiness to know that I am helping make other people as happy um, in their understanding of chocolate and their enjoyment of it. Um, and until then, until the next time, everyone, um, ciao. Thank you very much. Um, and I hope everybody here in the United States, their Thanksgiving weekend was everything they wanted it to be. Until next Friday. Ciao.